couple things, um, kids, as you're listening, there's a few key words that are in your bulletin and you can ask your parents about them. So as you learn about these um, concepts, uh, we want you to be able to, to know what they are. And so those are listed there on the other side. Um, humanism, so listen carefully, I'm gonna define that for you. So you understand what that is, sin, um, depravity and presupposition. So those are some of the key words that you'll hear from me tonight. So make sure you uh, are listening for those. All right, go ahead and open up your Bibles to the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 115 is where we'll be. Psalm 115 verses 1 through 9. So you can turn there. Psalm 115. I want to read that first and then uh, we'll pray and, and jump right in. Psalm 115, verses 1 through 9. These are the words of God. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. Why should the nations say, Where now is their God? But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. Those who make them will become like them, everyone who trusts in them. Let's pray. Our Father and gracious God, we give thanks to you because in your providence, you have placed us here in this place at this time. We don't take that lightly, knowing that to whom much is given, much is required. We confess that you've given us a tremendous amount, and we also confess that much of the time we have squandered it. We repent for doing so. Help us, Spirit, to hear these words and apply these words for the cross and the crown of our King. In Christ's name I pray, amen. All right. So tonight we're uh, kicking off a new series, The Politics of Humanism, and I thought I would at least explain to you why we would do something like this and also give you some sort of semblance as to where we intend to go with the series. So, so far the plan is to do um, nine weeks but as we move along, I may alter it a little bit, maybe add some weeks, maybe subtract some, we'll see how it goes. For almost a year now, I've wanted to do a series like this because the doctrine of humanism is itself both a growing trend and a growing problem. This means if we want to be faithful Christians in an age of rampant, unbridled humanism, we must know our interlocutors and be able to dismantle their ungodly worldview. If it's true that it, it's our job to take the land, to Christianize the land, and that's absolutely what the Great Commission is all about, then it follows from this that we must be committed to understanding the rival anti-Christian worldviews that are being pontificated out in the public square. So when we understand them, then we can dismantle them, and dismantle we must do. That's the logic behind why we would do a series like this, that and coupled with the fact that the church has by and large refused to discuss any of these topics for various reasons we'll get into later. So as we'll see shortly, humanism can be a tricky thing to nail to the wall because like Jello, once you touch it, it gets really squirmy. Now this means that we're going to have to spend a lot of time referencing various people and various works so that you can kind of get an idea of what's being said, and hopefully when we look at the various scriptural passages that we'll look at, we'll be prepared, better prepared to um, and equipped to sort of bring forth our onslaught of our uh, apologetic. That's the hope. So tonight we're just going to examine humanism. The series is The Politics of Humanism, and so I wanted to start with defining what humanism is. And then sort of just show from the Bible why humanism is in fact the religion of fallen man. Fallen man. Um, Brother John read Genesis 3. I'll reference that later. But fallen man being man in general 
as he and she, all of us, have fallen into sin, um, but when, when you're a humanist, or when, when you're fallen in sin, that's your religion, you're a humanist, so we'll see that a little bit later. Now, I should say this too, humanists would already be frustrated um, because they do not see uh, themselves as being religious. Um, but the reality is they are the most ardent of religious people. They are very passionate about what they believe. It doesn't take five minutes on a college campus to find that real quick either. So men in their sins will, def by default, will default to this humanistic religion long before they bow the knee to the creator God. So by default, man is in this humanistic scheme of things long before they will ever bow before God. So in the next few weeks, we're going to pull apart sort of the various layers of this religious dogma by looking at a lot of the philosophical underpinnings of the worldview. And not only that, how those philosophies and underpinnings work themselves out into every area of life. So know this. Humanism is a religion of dominion. So make no mistake. Humanism is a religion of dominion. We'll come back to that too. And it, as we'll see, it does seep into every area of life. And so we're going to cover things like next week, we're going to cover socialism. Um, we're going to talk about sexuality, education, immigration, just war, um, the drug war itself and what that's done to, to people. We're going to examine that on one week. We're going to talk about guns. We're going to talk about racism and a lot of the things that, frankly, the public square has been talking about for a while and the church has not got the memo. So anywhere you look, humanism is attempting to be the religious social order of the day. That's what it's attempting to do. So we have to not be silent about it. So having said all that, let's go ahead and get to work. It was Monday, October 29th, 1945. Monday, October 29th, 1945, when the then 40-year-old French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre delivered a lecture at Club Maintenant in Paris called Existentialism is the New Humanism. Two years before this, Sartre had published his famous book, Being and Nothingness, and since that had caused quite a stir, he accepted the invitation to give this lecture in Paris on existentialism with the hope of correcting his detractors. That was the hope that night. So on the one hand, he had Catholics and Christians who were sort of um, deriding him and criticizing him. But on the other hand, he even had the communists upset with him, giving their fair share criticism as well. So Sartre himself, he needed to... Uh, he needed to clear the air, and so that's what he did in Paris on that Monday evening. In short, Sartre, most certainly not the first existentialist, in fact, Kierkegaard is largely considered to be its founder, though he never used the term. Sartre gave his understanding of humanistic philosophy through the lens of what we know as existentialism, which you might call sort of a branch of humanism. So while he disagreed with some things from men like Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher, and Dostoevsky, the Russian novelist and philosopher, and even Nietzsche, Nietzsche, the, the German philosopher, all of these men shared something in common despite living in different times. Sartre lived more later than the other ones. They shared something despite living in different times. Man is the starting point. Man is the starting point for all discussion and philosophy. That's what they shared in common. From Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard, several years before Sartre himself, Sartre was born in 1905. I believe Kierkegaard died in like 1880s. I may have that wrong, but my memory may not be serving me correctly on that. But Sartre, Kierkegaard lived before him. But all these men, these philosophers, whether they were Russian or English, you name it, all of them had one thing in common. Man is the starting point for all discussion in philosophy. We start with man. So with the Enlightenment's emphasis on things like rationalism and skepticism, uh, skepticism meaning that uh, we, there are some things we'll just, we just don't know, we can't know. Not only that, a rejection of God, this movement, this Enlightenment, sort of paved the way and launched this existential movement thanks to men like Rene Descartes, you probably heard of him, John Locke and David Hume. 
So with God out of the way and God declared dead, these philosophers then said man could only look to himself. God's gone. He's out of the picture. Man can only look to himself for the answers. And this is where Sartre comes in. Sartre's famous quip, he said, existence precedes essence. That formed the thrust of his existentialistic humanism. Existence precedes essence. I'll explain that. What he argued was that man begins with existence. Man begins with existence without any sort of foreordination or preset expectations. Man begins with existence and then he follows this existence with his essence, his personality. In other words, I'm just going to quote him and you can listen to what he actually said in this lecture that night. What, Sar what he means is this, quote, man first exists, he materializes in the world, he encounters himself, and only afterward defines himself. If man, as existentialists conceive of him, cannot be defined, it is because, to begin with, he is nothing. He will not be anything until later, and then he will be what he makes of himself. Thus, there is no human nature, since there is no God to conceive of it. Sartre continues, man is not only that which he conceives himself to be, but that which he wills himself to be. And since he conceives of himself only after he exists, just as he wills himself to be after being thrown into existence, man is nothing other than what he makes himself. This is the first principle of existentialism. Now, we're going to bend your mind a little bit tonight on some of this stuff, but hopefully you caught the nonsense there. He presupposes that God does not exist, and, with, and, and basically and with this presupposition comes attached to it zero expectation of meaning. Meaning is gone. Man is brought into the world. There's no strings attached. All You were just born. You existed. There was a, a time when you existed. And of course, our culture debates, you know, after the magic um, birth canal, as Brother Jordan likes to call it, suddenly, you know, a person's a person. There's that nonsense. But so man, he, there's no strings attached. There's no moral, philosophical expectations that are involved. Man just is. He's born, he is nothing, and then he arrives on the scene as a person who has to figure things out. So then, and only then, can he begin to define himself and the world around him. Sartre also says that man isn't just what he can dream up, it's what he wills for himself, what he does. So then and only then can a definition be had, or better yet, made. So because humanists like Sartre and others cannot and will not submit themselves to God, they are forced to create a system of explaining the world that is both free from external consequence and free from having to submit to God's commands, God's desires. After all, it was the Russian philosopher Dostoevsky, um, Dostoevsky he, he, he wrote this. He said, if God does not exist, everything is permissible. If God does not exist, starting with the presupposition, if that's true, everything is permissible. So I hope you can see the destructive nature of humanism. And I want to look at our text now in Psalm 115 to, to demonstrate further the folly of the humanist religion. Now in verse 1, the psalmist gives us a, a starting point, uh, the presuppositional starting point. He says, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. God gets the glory, not man. That's where we start. God gets the glory, not man. We start with God the creator and his loving kindness and his truth. Now the context here is with regard to, to Israel. Israel's being mocked for their weakness um, mocked for their helplessness. Where is your God, right? They were being chided for their um, for God not being anywhere to be found and things going rough for them. Uh, they were being mocked for their trust and their hope in the Lord. And it's the humanist mocker who says in verse 2, where now is their God? Where now is their God? It doesn't take you five minutes at a college campus for someone to say that to you, essentially. Where is your God? I can't see him. I remember just a short couple of weeks ago having a lengthy conversation with a young man 
who insisted that if God just would step in front of him right now, he would believe. He just kept pounding that with me, arguing about it. If, if God's true, why doesn't he just reveal himself? That's a form of mockery. If God, what he's saying is if God would succumb to my desire, my wish, then he's a humanist. He's a humanist. Where now is their God? For the humanist mocker who says that, we must understand that not only God that is, the only God that's acceptable for the humanist is a God who serves them, who serves their desires and meets their demands, who acquiesces to their requirements. That's the only God that'll do for the humanist. Essentially, the writer is, is, is begins by saying this, God, the glory is yours, not ours. So why would you allow our enemies to taunt you, to, to question you, to demean you? The opening pleading here is for God to step in and not allow their scoffing to continue. The Psalms are very raw, <laughs> very raw. Where is your God? Where is he? Now, at this point, we could stop reading and assume that the writer and us who sometimes thinks the same things should just go on, uh, go on about whining about our condition and sort of retreating from the world. <laughs> After all, that's what the church has done retreated. Instead of building things and fighting, she has retreated and complained. But the writer does no such thing, nor should we. What does the psalmist say next and suggest to us next? Well, the idols of the heathens are impotent and obtuse. They're impotent. They're foolish. They're dumb. Our God is in the heavens, which means that our God is the true sovereign. He does whatever he pleases because he's the ultimate one. He's the, the true one true God. His sovereign will is what matters. But what about the other gods? What about the gods of the heathens? Well, verse 4 says that these gods are silver and gold, which means they have pulled them out of God's earth <laughs> and they've fashioned them with hands that God gave them. Look at 5 and 7. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. They are completely and entirely impotent. Now, for the humanist religion, the purpose of their God is to serve them in their declared word. They say what they wanted to say. But the biblical religion, the faith of the one true God, is a faith that serves the God of creation. It's backwards. See, God is not to be counseled or governed by man. Rather, man is counseled and governed by God. Now, it's interesting the way in which the Bible describes false gods. They can't speak, they can't see, they can't hear, uh, they can't smell, they can't feel, they can't walk, and they can't even make a peep with their throats. Now, don't miss this. Because this is a devastating critique. Isaiah spends quite a bit of time talking about it too. All of those things, their idols cannot do. But what, besides man, what can do these things? Can walk and make noises with their mouth. Animals, bingo. Nice job, Anna. Animals do that. Animals, their false gods can't even do that, but animals can do it. It's a mockery. Idols are lifeless. They're meaningless. They're purposeless. They're ultimately powerless. They can do nothing. And look at verse 8. This is a very important verse. You should know this. Those who make them will become like them. Those who make them will become like them. Everyone who trusts in them. The end goal of people who worship false gods, and I'm throwing, I'm purposefully throwing all the relig false religions of the world into the same humanistic basket. The end goal for people who worship false gods is that they become like the gods they worship. You are what you worship. Be it the naturalist, the Darwinian evolutionist, be it the nihilist. Be it the Jehovah's Witness, Mormon, Muslim, all these other religions, all of them become like what they worship. They're radically impotent and they're audaciously incompetent. 
Ultimately, these idols and the people who follow them will be frustrated and powerless in history. So their impotence is clearly seen in the fact that their man-centered religion is the very problem. And thus, in their futility, they think that they can fix it, right? Man is the problem, that we agree. Genesis 3 is clear. Man's the problem, yes. But the answer is not found in man. But the humanist thinks that he can find it. Um, before moving here, we had spent several years at a church there and you know, did dozens of weddings and funerals. But as, as far as like premarital counseling with couples, uh, or even post-marital, as it were, you know, just sort of sitting down and talking, and there's always this common thread. Like the one just wants to bark at the other, and the other one barks at the other. And well, you do this, and you always do this, and da 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 da. And and sometimes I'll just say, like, what do you think the solution is? Because if you're the problem, you are not the solution. It's got to be outside of you. Thus, the same situation with the humanists. Now, <clears throat> this past week, I did a whole lot of reading and digging in because I wanted to learn more about humanism, broadly speaking. And so I was curious to learn more about what they say, what, especially of today. What are, these, what are these humanists who are out there? And they're everywhere. Uh, professors at universities, high school teachers, you name it, they're everywhere. What, what do they say? What, what are their convictions? To start, I found the International Humanist and Ethical Union website. Say that five times fast. And here is their definition of humanism. I want you to listen closely. Humanism is a democratic and ethical life stance that affirms that human beings have the right and responsibility to give meaning and shape to their own lives. Humanism stands for the building of a more humane society through an ethics based on human and other natural values in a spirit of reason and free inquiry through human capabilities. Humanism is not theistic, they say, and it does not accept supernatural views of reality. So take note the viciously circled, circular problem here. Humans must give shape to their own lives. So notice Sartre's thinking there. You're nothing and then you get, that's that blank slate Lucas mentioned earlier, the clean slate. It's empty and you just sort of get to paint your own life on it. So they have to give shape to their own lives and thus they are free to do as they please. However, they know that that can sound crazy because pedophiles do as they please. So they need, they can't say that. They have to, they have to have some ethical stipulation. So they need an ethical grid. And so they create their own little version of a quote, more humane society. And they base that on quote, human and other natural values in a spirit of reason and free inquiry through human capabilities. Let me just tell you, they aren't saying anything, really. They're not saying anything. Humans should shape their own destiny with no outside control. Read, no God. And in order to do that, in, order, in, in their pursuit of this meaning and shape, they must be ethical. But that's sort of a natural thing that comes about anyway, right? It's, uh, it's rubbish, if we may use the English phrase. Another site I looked at, speaking of the English, was the Humanists UK group, a site dedicated to humanism in the United Kingdom. The heading of the one section said, think for, our, think for yourself, act for everyone. And this was followed up with another couple of statements. Listen carefully. At Humanists UK, I, I imagine sort of this nice commercial during the Super Bowl or something. At Humanists UK, we want a tolerant world where rational thinking and kindness prevails. Okay. Rational thinking and kindness prevails. All right, got it. We work to support lasting change for a better society, championing ideas for the one life we have. We do this because we're humanists, people who shape our own lives in the here and now because we believe it's the only life we get. That's what they're saying. I. If you're a humanist, you have one life, live it however you want. Just be careful. I also read a little book called Humanism by Stephen Law this week on Kindle. Oxford has put out a, 
a, it's a, really a good series, but they, they call it a very short introduction. So they're very small books, very little. And uh, he wrote this one and the series covers tons of topics. Well, Stephen Law, he wrote this one. It's a short book, it's very accessible. And you know, Stephen, Stephen Law is a reader in philosophy at Haythrop College in the University of London. He's an editor of a, a philosophical journal called Think, ironically. You got, we gotta be free thinkers here, that's the idea. And in his little book, he describes in a nutshell what humanists believe, and I'm gonna blow through these quickly. Number one, humanists believe since, and <laughs> they believe science and reason more generally are invaluable tools we can and should apply to all areas of life. No belief should be considered off limits and protected from rational scrutiny. Number two, humanists are either atheistic or agnostic. Three, humanists believe that this life is the only life we have. Four, humanism involves a commitment to the existence and importance of moral value. And I know what you're all thinking, where did you get that? He goes on, ethics should be strongly informed by study of what human beings are actually like and, and of what will help them flourish in this world rather than the next. Why do you need to flourish? Number five, humanists emphasize individual moral autonomy. It's like they, did, they even just say it, autonomy. They reject external authority hanging over one's head telling them what is right and wrong. Read God. Number six, Humanists believe our lives can have meaning without it being bestowed from above by God. Where do you get that? Where's, where do you get meaning? And seven, humanists are secularists in the sense that they favor an open democratic society in which the state takes a neutral position with respect to religion. Now you would think that I was talking about the church I'm talking about the humanists. So as you can see, I think it's clear, humanism is a deeply problematic worldview, religion, with inconsistencies running all the way down through it. And this is because the answer to the question, what is man, is answered with whatever he wants to be. But this question we should be asking, what is man? What is man? Who are, who am I? Who are you? That's a great question. But the humanist can only conceive of an answer in terms of himself. He can't look past himself into the realm of the metaphysical, the truly transcendent, the sovereign. This is because he will not submit to the external word and external authority. So at the root level, humanism is self-blinding. It's self-blinding. Humanists refuse to look beyond themselves to the, to the one true God the triune God, God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. When, when this humanist throws off his obligation to serve God, he, his pursuit becomes, as Van Til said, disintegration into the void. His, his quest becomes this pursuit of blindness, speechlessness, and idiocy. When man looks to himself for the answers, he goes further and further into sin and darkness. He is dull and he is dead. No matter what these humanist scholars say, and trust me, they sound smart. They sound smart. You can read them. I need a shower after I read one of them. It's depressing. They sound intelligent. They sound witty. They sound like they have crea creative arguments for existence apart from God. They see themselves, though, as the word of truth, the source of revelation, the source of power. And the problem is that his religion is unable to reform and revive himself. Can't do it. His religion only serves to execute his lusts as he burns with desire. This is the same problem that traces all the way back to Genesis 3, 5, when Adam and Eve wanted to determine good and evil themselves. That's what they wanted. They wanted to determine good and evil. And, and that humanistic spirit has rippled through time, the, the halls of history and time, and the logical outcome of this pursuit is destruction. Why, do you, why else do we have a culture that kills more than 3,000 children every single day? That's destruction. 
It's a holocaust beyond what Hitler could have ever dreamed of. See, the gospel message restores a man to his dominion calling under God. That's what it does. Without this restoration, man is dead in his humanist religion. He's unable to have dominion the way God intends. He still tries to have dominion. Notice that both Stephen Law and the one website I spoke of, both of them spoke in terms of all of life. Did you notice that? I mean, good grief, the church at large won't even speak of those in those terms. But you better believe that the humanists are. And they're saying things like, we need public education, and we're going to go get it. And guess what? They got it. They got it. Whether it's a K-12 through or a university, the humanists have got it. You think of Harvard and Yale, all these Ivy League schools that were founded by Christians. They're as pagan as anywhere in the world now. They got it. See, without the gospel of Jesus Christ restoring a man to his calling under God, he, he cannot and will not submit to God, and thus he will seek to dominate other men. Because that's the, those are the options. Either we will be dominated by Christ and follow him in service of him, or we will seek to dominate our fellow man. And we'll get into that when we talk about racism and some of the history there. This um, do-it-yourself religion, that's what Rush Duny called it. It's a man-made morality, an ethical outlook that seeks to legislate sin and perpetuate immorality. There is a reason why, after the Enlightenment and during the 19th and 20th centuries, you had a rise in revolutionary activity across the world. The humanistic religion took politics by storm with the rise of Marxism and even communism. The state became God. That's why I wore this shirt. The state became God and man because of the means of, of upholding this God. Man became the means of holding up the state into sort of this superiority. The whole George Orwell 1982 thing. These totalitarian politics... And go back for a second. Think about the millions and millions of lives who were snuffed out by radical communism. Be it Vietnam, Cambodia, the USSR. Millions. Atheists will try to say that. You know, Christians have killed so many people. And like, you know, the, the, the religious wars of, uh, you know, the Inquisition and all those different things. And, and then you had like, up here is the humanistic religion, the communists. See, all of these totalitarian politics has sort of became and ushered into this new age of man, one, one where the state controls every area of life and thus helps dictate that which is and that which will be. It was and is destructive because their gods are foolish and incompetent. So what do we do? Because that sounds bleak. Try reading the start. Yeah, you kind of, you know. It makes me think of the proverb, those who hate me love death. That's what it is. It's a love for death. So what do we do? Well, we have to know the politics of humanism by understanding humanism. We have to know that it is absolutely the root of this nasty tree that produces things like abortion on demand. That produces things like unjust taxation. And it produces all of these things that spring forth. We have to know it. We must see how just how pervasive this thinking is, both in our public schools and in our university. We must know how to do true presuppositionalism and how to imply the entire Bible to all of life. We must be bold and courageous enough to speak to the issues and offer up a true biblical answer. We must know biblical law. And we must take seriously the gospel of the kingdom of God. So the reality is, all the things we're going to talk about, listen, it's our problem. We need to fix it. So you ready to get to work? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and the truth found therein. We are thankful that you have brought us out of the pit of darkness and redeemed not just our hearts, but our minds as well. 
We are faced with a large problem in our culture today, and that of humanism. Men have thrown you to the side and tried to pursue a life without you. Worse still, the church has chosen not to deal with the problem, but instead falsely waited around for you to zap us off the planet. I ask and pray that you would awaken your bride from her sinful slumber and give us a passion and boldness to fight against the idols and ideas that prop themselves up over and against you. Give us a fuller vision for the gospel in time and in space and in history. I ask all of this in Christ's name, the King's name. Amen.